Uh, I just want to thank you all very much for coming. I know it's a Friday before spring break, so good for you for being here. Um, and thank you for the invitation to come and uh, speak with you. Can you all hear me okay? You hear me in the back there? Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Billy, and uh, I work with David Lowry in the plant biology department at uh, Michigan State University. I'm going to tell you today about um, some work I've done both as a postdoc and as a graduate student in the ecological genetic genetics of uh, wild plants. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can use the key. Yeah, that works. Um, so I've always been fascinated by plants. They have amazing uh, morphological diversity uh, and amazing beauty. In addition to morphological diversity, plants have amazing physiological diversity. Um, they're amazingly adapted uh, to the various habitats in which they occur. So as an ecological geneticist, uh, I'm interested in understanding the genetic basis of adaptive traits in plants and also understanding how those traits evolve over time. So as I mentioned, I'm going to tell you today about three different plants that I've worked on. Uh, one as a graduate student, this um, species here, sweet vernal grass, and two as a postdoc, the uh, model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, the small mustard plant, and this uh, wildflower, the yellow monkey flower, the new cicadas that I'm working at at Michigan State uh, with the little now. So as a graduate student at Cornell University, which is in central New York, uh, I worked on this species, sweet vernal grass, uh, also known as Anthoxanthum odoratum is a little bit of a mouthful. And the trait I studied in anthoxanthum is tolerance to acid soils, particularly through tolerance uh, of aluminum that occurs in those soils. Aluminum is actually the third most abundant element in the, in the earth's crust, so it's very common in soils. And it doesn't normally cause a problem for plants, but when soils become acidified, it speciates into different ions. And um, as soils become more acid, this Al3 plus ion, which is really toxic to plants, becomes really common. Um, and as you can kind of see on this map here, acid soils actually occur all throughout the world. They're shown by the reddish areas on this map. So acid soils pose problems for agriculture in places like South America, in um, Central Africa, and even places like the Northeast and the U.S. where there's problems with acid rain. Are there areas of a lot of rain in those areas? Is that why the soil is acid because of the rain, or is it acid before the rain? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so there's a bunch of different causes of acid soils, and some of them are artificial and some of them are natural. So acid soils can result from just the natural weathering of soils and also what the, the parent bedrock material is made out of. Um, generally, the older the soils, the more acid, um, depending on the bedrock. Um, acid soils also result from things like um, acid mining practices and mine tailings that are just dumped in places. We also get acid soils from air pollution and acid deposition, like we've had some in the northeast U U.S. You also get acid soils from the repeated use of fertilizers over time that sort of leach all of the base cations out of the soil. So there's a lot of different causes for that pattern that we see. So the way that uh, aluminum actually damages plants is primarily at the root tips, or at least first at the root tips. This is a, an electron micrograph of a, um, a, root, a root tip of a wheat seedling here up on the left. The one on the left is a normal, normal wheat seedling, and the one on the right is one that's been growing in an aluminum solution. And what happens is the aluminum actually attaches to the cell walls of the, the root and it makes them rigid so that as the root grows and expands through the soil or whatever it's growing in, it forms lesions and, and becomes deformed like you see in this image here. And for most plants that has um, pretty strong consequences for what you see above ground and the overall fitness of the plant. So this is a picture of corn growing in an acid soil in South America. The one on the left is an aluminum resistant variety and one is on the right is an aluminum sensitive variety. You can see that production is really decreased in those acid soils unless you have the right genes. So as it turns out, there's a lot of wild species of grasses and other, other plants that have uh, aluminum tolerance that's a lot higher than you find in most cultivated species. And this is one of them, um, this sweet vernal grass. It's uh, native to Europe and it's introduced in the United States. So in studying sweet vernal grass, I wanted to ask a few basic questions about trait evolution. First, we wanted to find out if there's local adaptation to soil aluminum. So we want to find out if plants that are growing in high aluminum soils, if they actually have a higher tolerance of aluminum than plants that are growing on low aluminum soils, if there's a genetic difference between those different populations. And once we find that genetic difference, we want to ask what are the genes that control that trait? What are the genes that's facilitated the evolution of that trait over time? 
once we know the genes, we can ask the question, are those genes the same or different between different grass species? Does this wild grass here, um, does it use the same genes to tolerate aluminum as these other grasses that we know of, um, our edible grasses, corn, sorghum, wheat, and rice? So as a graduate student, my first year, one of the first things I did was try and develop an assay for measuring aluminum tolerance in this grass, which hadn't been done before. Uh, so building off of some of the systems that they use in crops, I developed a hydroponic way of measuring root growth. So I was able to grow up adult plants in the greenhouse and then separate off vegetative tillers over time so I can have lots of replicates of each, each genotype, put them in these big tubs of solution with some aeration and these foam wraps, and then I was able to measure the root growth over time. And I could use both a solution that has just nutrients in it and a solution that has nutrients plus a lot of aluminum added to it, so I have sort of a control treatment and an aluminum treatment for comparing. Um, it was kind of fun developing this system, experimenting with different, uh, you know, pet store air pump filters and, and flooding the lab once in a while. So it was, it was a, kind of a fun project to get started with. Um, so once I had my hydroponic system going, I, I collected plants from six different populations around where the university is. So this is Cayuga Lake here, one of the Finger Lakes in New York, and Cornell's located right down here at the bottom. These are the six different locations where I collected plants, and they're from a whole range of soil types, all the way from low aluminum soil to high aluminum soil. I put them in the hydroponic assay, and I saw how they did. And what I found was this. I'm sorry, those bars aren't showing up great, but there are, there are gray bars underneath these little uh, error bars up at the top here. <laughs> um, but what you can see from this graph is that there isn't very much um, indication of local adaptation where this plant is growing in the U.S. So the populations are ordered from most acid, high aluminum soils to low aluminum soils. And the light gray bars are showing root growth in the control treatment. They're all pretty high. The roots do pretty well. They vary a little bit. And then root growth in the aluminum treatment suit, uh, is shown in the dark gray bars. And you can see that they're all reduced by about the same amount. There isn't any indication that plants from the more acid, high aluminum soils are necessarily doing better than the plants in the low, in the low aluminum soils. Um, so that was uh, an interesting result, but a little bit disappointing from the standpoint of genetic variation. We, we don't necessarily know that there, there are genetic differences, at least with regard to root growth, that we're looking for um, here in this graph. But as I was going through the literature and reading more about other people's work on sweet myrtle grass, I came across um, some older experiments where someone had actually already looked at sweet myrtle grass in the context of aluminum tolerance. And that was in the 70s in a place called the part grass experiment. Um, the Park Grass Experiment um, is now a large agricultural station. It's located in Harpenden, England, and it's, it's often cited as the longest running experiment in the world. It was started uh, by agriculturists in 1856, so this is back in the days of Darwin. Um, and what they did is they took this large hay meadow and they divided it up into experimental plots and they superimposed um, fertilizer treatments going this way and then liming treatments going this way. So there's a huge variety of different soil types at the plots and this experiment actually continues to this day. These are, these are fun. These are actually just some early images of the work that they do there. They collect hay samples every year. They collect soil samples. Um, and they still do this on an annual basis. And there's a great archive of, of historical material there. So, in 1973, Davies and Snaden actually looked at sweet vernal grass that's grown across almost all of the plots there at the part grass experiment. They took them and they put them in a similar hydroponic setup, a um, little different than mine, but, but similar in some ways. And they actually found local adaptation at this very small spatial scale of plots within a field. So they found plants from the high aluminum acid soil plots shown in black here. They had better root growth than, in aluminum than the plants from the low, um, the low aluminum plots at the part grass experiment. Even though these plants are all living right next to each other on different soils, they're probably exchanging a lot of genes at the same time. So this was an example of a local adaptation on a small scale, and also local adaptation that had evolved pretty rapidly because the experiment had only been running for you know 150 years, which is a small amount of time in, in, a, in uh, when we're looking at sweet vernal grass for only about 75 generations. So I was excited to read about this, and, and so excited to read about the part grass experiment. So I wrote to them and asked if I could come, and they said, sure, come and, and look at the, the experiment and, and come collect seeds. So that's what I did. Um, in 2010, I went and visited England, which was a lot of fun, and I, I went to the um, Park Grass Experiment, which is located in the beautiful English countryside, and I stayed, this is kind of what the experiment looks like, um, just the, the, large, the large field and the plots are demarked by these placards still, and I stayed in this 400-year-old manor house 
which is still there on the property and met a lot of interesting researchers from all over the world there. Um, so I collected, collected seeds and um, talked to people there and came back to Cornell and put, grew the plants up and put them in my uh, hydroponic setup. And I wanted to test and see if this local adaptation that was observed in the 70s is still, still existed there. And what I found was, um, at least for adult plants, um, there was a small but detectable signature of local adaptation. So um, even though it's small, it's significant. Plants from the high aluminum plots at the part grass experiment, their root growth does slightly better um, in the aluminum treatment than plants from the low aluminum plot. So there's evidence that there's this evolved trait of aluminum tolerance at the part grass experiment. Um, I also looked at seedlings. I experimented with seeds a little bit. I found a way to germinate them on solid media in these little conical tubes, and then I would transfer them to the hydroponics and measure their root growth. And in the seedlings, I also saw this signature of local adaptation to aluminum. Um, so in the aluminum exposure treatments, the plants with uh, the, the seedlings that came from the high aluminum plots did a lot better. They had better root growth in the face of aluminum. So I was able to verify that this pattern still exists at the cartographic scene. So now that I had some groups of plants that show genetic variation for this important adaptive trait, I wanted to ask what genes are involved. How does this, how does this plant genetically uh, resist aluminum? Um, so I took an RNA sequencing approach to do this, um, which is a form of next generation short read sequencing. Um, I took one highly tolerant plant from the part graph experiment and one highly sensitive plant. I put them in the control treatment and the aluminum treatment, and I made a sequencing library out of each one. So we have two treatments and two genotypes. What I get out of this sequencing effort is um, the sequence of all of the genes that are expressed in the plant when it's growing in the hydroponics, and also the expression level of all of those genes, whether those genes are being used in the organism or not. And lastly, I'll be able to compare the sequences between the tolerant genotype and the sensitive genotype to see where there are genetic polymorphisms between the two. So because this is a non-model plant, there hasn't been a genome sequence for sweet vernal grass. It's actually a tetraploid, so it has a fairly complex genome. Um, we did what's called a de novo assembly using the software Trinity. It takes all of the short read sequencing fragments and puts them back together like a giant puzzle and assembles the sequences uh, of all of the genes that are being expressed in the plant. Um, we found about 85,000 expressed transcripts in the plant, and they fall into all of the various categories you find in the typical plant genome. I won't go through them all for you. Um, and then within that uh, set of expressed transcripts, we can look at the expression level of all of these genes, and we can see which, which of those genes are turned on or turned off in response to the aluminum that I treated the plants with. So remember, there's a sensitive plant and a tolerant plant for aluminum, and the genes in those two genotypes are either upregulated, which is shown in red, or they're downregulated, shown in blue, in response to the aluminum. And it was actually a small fraction of those 84, 85,000 genes that we identified, which were actually responding to the aluminum, well, only about 1,300 of them, which is good news for us. It's fewer, fewer candidate genes to look for or to look through uh, with regard to this trait. So the, the primary aluminum responsive transcripts that I was interested in fall into these two categories here. They're either consistently upregulated in the two genotypes or they're consistently downregulated in the two genotypes, the, the main point being that they're, they respond to that aluminum. And so I asked, well, what are these? So I can compare all of the sequences in sweet myrtle grass with, with all of the sequences that have been uh, sequenced for other grasses, especially the agricultural grasses like wheat and corn. Um, so if this is a diagram of a root tip, it shows um, the different mechanisms or some of the different mechanisms that we know about that plants use to resist aluminum. So some plants um, are organic acid exuders, so they take organic acids, they exude them into the soils, the organic acid attaches to the aluminum and makes it hard for the plant to take up. And so within our set of candidate genes in sweet vernal grass, we found two major organic acid transport genes, the ALMTs and the mates. The LMTs are aluminum-sensitive malate transporters, and the mates are citrate transporters. So we know that sweet vernal grass uses um, these two categories of well-known organic acid transporters to resist aluminum. We also found genes that are uh, involved in cell wall modification. Sometimes plants will modify their cell walls so that the um, aluminum can't attach to it as well. And we found this, these sugar transferases and this star one, which is a modification, cell wall modification gene that we know from life. So we know that um, sweet vernal grass uses this mechanism. And lastly, we also found some genes that are involved in the aluminum sequestration pathway, um, which is known primarily from rice. These are transporters that actively take aluminum from the apoplast of the root, 
transport it to the vacuole where it's stored in an inert form where it can't hurt the plant. We also found aluminum responsive genes, um, 60 of them, which we couldn't annotate their function. They didn't really match closely enough anything that's already out there. So we know that sweet vernal grass uses these well-known genes as well as a sweet, uh, fairly large suite of genes of unknown function to resist aluminum. So the question remains, which of those genes, all of those genes are responsive to aluminum, but probably only a few of them contain mutations that allowed the tolerance trait to evolve over time with the part grass experiment. Those mutations would have been under natural selection as the soils were acidifying. Um, and so to get at that central question, we looked at the expression levels of these genes. And you can see that for some of these candid genes, in the tolerant individual, there's upregulation, but it's a lot higher upregulation than in the sensitive individual, or like this one here. We see a greater degree of upregulation in the tolerant individual than the sensitive individual. So that's an indication that maybe there's a mutation in or near that gene that's facilitating adaptation in this scenario. So um, we took that, we took a, a subset of those candidate genes for adaptation and we genotyped single nucleotide polymorphisms in those genes, which looks like this, just where you have a one base pair difference between the sensitive genotype and the tolerant genotype of the plant. So we had 44 of those candidate SNPs, and we also genotyped 83 non-candidate SNPs just for comparison. And what we did with the SNP data, once we genotyped, I think it was maybe 108 plants we had all together in this cohort. Um, we calculated FST, or differentiation, for these SNPs. And um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with FST, but it's a pretty commonly used measure of differentiation. So if you have a, an allele or a SNP that occurs at an equal frequency in two different groups, say the plants on, on high aluminum soils and the plants on low aluminum soils, you'd say it's not very differentiated, that's an FST of zero. But if you have an allele that occurs almost always on acid soils and almost never on non-acid soils, you'd say it's highly differentiated, and that's an FST of 1. So if we find a SNP that has a high FST value, that means that it may be a, a gene that's been used in the evolution of the trait. So the results from that um, survey was this. So this is the frequency distribution of the uh, non-candidate background SNPs. And you can see most of them have pretty low FST values. Most of them are pretty well mixed across the park grass experiment. And then the FST values of all of our candidate SNPs are across the top. And we found that most of the candidate SNPs, they, they fall well within the range of the background levels of the genome. But a few of them, these three in particular up here, they had very high FST values, higher than any other SNP that we looked at. So this is a strong indication that these three genes may have been involved in the, the rapid evolution of this aluminum tolerance trait at the part grass experiment. Um, they're that star one cell modification gene I mentioned before. This um, malate transporter that I also mentioned, and this TIP2 locus, which is a tonoplast intrinsic protein possibly involved in aluminum sequestration. So overall, from my work on sweet vernal grass as a grad student, I was able to get um, pretty good answers to most of these questions. Um, are wild populations locally adapted to soil aluminum found? Maybe not so much in, in the introduced range of the species, um, but definitely still at the part grass experiment. Um, we asked what genes control this trait. We, we found genes in cell, cell wall modifiers, organic acid transporters, um, and sequestration genes. Many well-known genes um, are involved in this response, as well as that suite of unknown genes that we don't know very much about. And within the genes that are involved in the evolution of this trait, it seems like the answer to this last question is both yes and no. So some genes we know about from other species, like rice and corn, they're definitely used by anthraxanthins to, to develop this trait over time, at least at part grass. But it's also possible that some of those unknown genes that we do the genotype are involved in the evolution of this trait. So uh, I think further studies on the rest of that list of candidate genes would be an interesting way to go with this, this in the future. So in contrast to uh, sweet vernal grass, which is um, a grass that's out and it's mostly outcrossing and it reproduces by seed, um, I did a project looking at the evolution of, of a trait in Arabidopsis thaliana. And some of you may be familiar with uh, Arabidopsis. I believe one of the common names is mouthy or cress. Um, it's a small weed that is actually native to Europe. It grows throughout Europe. And it's been introduced in the United States um, for, I think, maybe since about the 1800s are, are some of the first botanical uh, herbarium records. Um, I worked on Arabidopsis with John Stinchcomb when I was up at the University of Toronto. So when you have plants that are native to one range and then they're introduced into another range, it offers kind of a natural experiment in evolution, in plant evolution. 
Um, oftentimes when you have a native and an introduced population, you'll observe in nature that they form similar trait lines over geography or over environments. So for example, in purple loosestrife, which is shown here, there are flowering time climbs both in the native range and the introduced range. So plants further north tend to flower later in the seasons and plants further south uh, tend to flower um, earlier. Or no, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. So they tend to flower earlier in the north and later in the south. Um, similar, we, similarly, we, we observe trait, parallel trait climbs in the native and introduced range um, for other species such as the St. John's wort for vegetative and, uh, and, and other morphological traits, and Silene is another example. So remember, Abapsis is one of these species that has a native and an introduced range. Um, and in 2012, uh, Karen Samus and others discovered that there was a flowering time climb mirrored in the Europe, European native range and in the uh, North American uh, introduced range. So in both continents, plants that grow closer to the coast tend to flower later. Um, this is a, a, a graph of the North American data, and this is a graph of the Euro Eurasian data. And so they got this data by growing up plants on the rooftop of the biology building at the University of Toronto, growing all these plants in the common garden, just measuring their flower flowering time, and we found, they found this was a, a quite repeatable pattern. Well, as it turns out, Arabidopsis has been studied for, for decades now, especially in Europe where it grows natively. And there's something known about the evolution of flowering time in native populations. These uh, major loci contribute to most of the variation they see in PCL mapping studies. So this FLC, FRI uh, interacting genes uh, contribute a lot of the variation. We also see a lot of flowering time is due to mutations in the MAP2 locus or in the 5C locus. So the project I worked on in Toronto was to ask the question, um, is the genetic basis of flowering time evolution in the native range of the species the same as the genetic basis of the evolution that happened in the introduced range? So is evolution repeatable at the level of genes? So to do this project, we took uh, all of the earliest flowering lines we had and all of the latest flowering lines we had from the introduced range, um, and we took a whole genome sequencing approach. So um, we took the genomes of each, each group of plants and we sequenced each one individually after barcoding them. Uh, in the end, we had about 32 individuals, and they're spread across 14 different populations in the eastern United States. We compared all of our genomes to the reference genome for Arabidopsis, which has been around for a while now, and we found about 750,000 uh, single nucleotide variants that, that we could look at that potentially um, lead to the evolution of traits in this plant. So with all of our, our 750,000 markers, the first thing we did is we wanted to ask how is Arabidopsis in the introduced range related to its cousins or its ancestors in the, in the native range? Do all of the plants in the US, do they all come from one location in Europe? There's just one seed that came over the ocean and spread out, or did it come from multiple locations? So we compared our samples, which are shown in light blue, to samples collected from other researchers and genotyped by other researchers, uh, which are shown in the dark blue and in the red. And you notice that they're located all over Eurasia. And we built a phylogenetic tree out of these samples. Um, and it's a little hard to see here, but, but what you can tell is that our samples, which are shown in red, are interspersed all throughout this tree. All of the other samples are shown in black and gray. And what that's an indicator of is that plants in the, in the uh, introduced range come from all over the world. They may have been introduced multiple times uh, over time at different, different points in history. It's not that there was a single colonization event that radiated out from there. There's this complex history of multiple introductions over time. This is a weed, this is not a domestic plant. Yeah, I mean, laboratory strains, maybe you could call domesticated, but yes, it's a weed. I mean, it's not somebody brought it over for a special purpose, you're going to bring this flower over. There. Yeah, yeah, no, as, if I had to guess, it came as a contaminant of something. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not, not grown ornamentally that I know of. Um, so using our genome-wide data, the next thing we did was to conduct genome scans, which is a popular technique nowadays. And what you do is you take all your variants and you sort of scan in windows across the genome. So this is an example of this data from um, chromosome one. You sort of scan in small windows across the genome, calculating statistics to detect the presence of natural selection in the genome. And the way that you do that um, is through a couple different methods. So one thing, uh, natural selection causes genomic variation to be reduced in the genome. Um, and so you can look for a signature that there's low polymorphism, like between the early flowering plants and the late flowering plants. We do that with a couple different statistics. This one called XPCLR, which um, measures likelihood of recent selective sweeps. And another one, nucleotide diversity, um, which as I kind of described before, is a difference in diversity between the early and late flowering plants. 
the other thing that natural selection does uh, in the genome is cause allele frequencies to be skewed. So this is exactly like the FST that I was talking about before. Um, you'll see an allele, and it'll only occur, occur mainly in the early flowering plants and not at all in the late flowering plants, and that's an indication that it might be involved in adaptation. And to do that, um, we measured this XTX statistic, which is um, like a modified version of FST that controls for sampling error and a few other things. So the results of our genome scans, we looked at the genes we identified in regions of the genome that have signatures of selection. And with these different signatures of selection, how do the different categories overlap? Um, we're also able to tell, because the Arabidopsis genome has been pretty well annotated, we know the function of each SNP, or the, the putative function of each SNP. We know that mutation, depending on its position, will impact the gene in a strong way or won't have any effect at all. We compared all of our candidate genes in the regions with a signature of selection to flowering time candidate genes that we already had some background information on that we already know are involved in flowering time and, to, and look to see if they overlap. And we're actually surprised to find that there was very little overlap. So this list of 300 or so genes, only, you know, maybe 17 of them um, actually overlapped with the genes we found in regions with signatures of selection, which is actually not more of them than you would expect to hit just by chance in these type, this type of work. So within our list of candidate genes, we asked our, our question from before, are any of our candidate genes these major ones that we know from the native ranges of species are involved in adaptation? Well, we didn't find FLC. We didn't find FRI. We saw no evidence that MAF2 was involved in adaptation. And for FICE, we also did not find any evidence that it was involved in adaptation in the introduced range. Instead, what we found among our candidate genes were things like this, this uh, heat shock protein involved in stress response, this HAF2C protein, which is involved in flowering under long days, or genes like this AGL developmental gene or this calmodulin signaling molecule. So they were all novel things that indicate these other genes that we didn't really know were involved in adaptation before are probably, at least some of them are facilitating the evolution of this flowering time plant in, in the um, introduced range. So that was kind of a surprising, a surprising result. And all of these new genes that we have as targets of, of the adaptive process in the, uh, in the introduced range will, will um, sort of provide future research targets. Because this is a Arabidopsis, we can bring it into the laboratory, we can make mutants, we can do all sorts of things with it. We'll be able to sort of functionally verify our candidate genes um, from this study in the future. So overall in Arabidopsis, we were able to say what the colonization history of the species is. It came from all over the world, probably in multiple introductions. Um, then we asked the question, was evolution parable, parallel or repeatable at the level of genes? And in this case, we found the answer was no. It's probably flowering time finds evolved through the use of different genes in the species native range and the species introduced range. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, these new candidate genes that came out of the study um, provide targets for future research. So lastly today, uh, I'm going to tell you about work that I've been doing currently with David Lowry at Michigan State. We're working on adaptation in the yellow monkey flower, Mimulus cutatus. Uh, yellow monkey flower is a species uh, in the mixed mating system, mostly outcrossing. It grows in the western part of the United States, uh, very charismatic. Um, at least I think it's kind of charismatic. Um, and we're looking at the evolution of ecotypes in this particular plant. So instead of just looking at one trait like the aluminum tolerance in this grass or the flowering time in Arabidopsis, we're looking at suites of traits. So Mimulus uh, has two different uh, ecotypes. Some, some populations grow in inland sort of dry habitats and some populations grow along the coast, showed by these blue dots. And when you grow them up together, they're very different even though they're the same species. So the ones from the coast uh, shown by this guy on the left here. They're very leafy, they branch a lot, they have a pretty large size. Um, they actually, they tend to be tolerant of salt spray and salt soils, and they tend to flower later in the season. Whereas these guys from the inland populations, they're very tiny, they flower early, they have little flowers, and they don't branch very much. So these are two different ecotypes that are still, they can still exchange genes, you could cross them together and get viable plants. Um, but they're very morphologically different because of the habitats that they grow in. So the questions we wanted to ask about these ecotypes in yellow monkey flower is first, can we use a, a new pooled sequencing approach to, to look at the genomics of this plant and understand adaptation? And then also secondly, um, our favorite question, what are the genes involved in the separation of these, this one species into two very distinct forms? 
So in Mimulus, um, one problem um, that it has, at least for genetics, and it's a problem characteristic of many wild plants, is that there's a lot of background signal. So the FST value for any two of these populations on average is about 0.48. So if we're doing our genome scans, we're looking across the genome, um, if we're looking for that signature of selection, it's going to be very hard to tell it from that background level of noise that we see. So that's a big challenge for a lot of these genome sequencing projects. So what we wanted to try and do was circumvent that problem by creating sequencing pools. So what we did is we took 101 individuals from 45 coastal populations and 92 individuals from about 52 inland populations. We made one coastal pool and one inland pool. Um, and then we sequenced the pools rather than sequencing the individual plants. So we looked at all of the data, we compared it to the Mimulus genome, which has recently come out. It's not, um, not as old as the Arabis, Arabidopsis genome that's been sequenced, but um, it has been assembled. Um, we found about 11 million variants um, from all of these uh, individuals that went into these pools. And we looked at the FST, uh, the average FST of those variants. We found that it was reduced down to, a point, down to about 0 0.006. So we were successfully able to use this method to sort of get around the statistical noise that we would have found otherwise, which is exciting for us after doing all of this sequencing. Uh, again, we took a genome scan approach to look for genes and regions of the genome that have a signature of selection. And in this case, we used three other statistics. We used the G statistic, which is very similar to FST. We used this DXY statistic, which shows regions of reduced introgression between the two ecotypes in the genome. And we looked at the nucleotide diversity ratio. We looked at the ratio of diversity in the inland annual populations to the diversity in the coastal populations. If one of those is reduced compared to the other, it's an indication that there might be natural selection going on in one of those populations. Um, these graphs uh, are showing you all of the chromosomes in the Mimulus genome, uh, chromosomes 1 through 14. And in between these dotted lines here are regions of the genome we know from previous studies are actually chromosomal inversions. And it's been shown in some sort of uh, QTL mapping studies that these chromosomal inversions are associated with adaptation. So you'll find one orientation of the inversion in the coastal populations and a different orientation of the inversion in the inland populations. Um, so it kind of a, it gives you some sort of idea that it might be involved in adaptation or there might be genes within that inversion that are involved in adaptation. So zooming in on those inverted regions, and there again, this is a single chromosome, chromosome 5 and chromosome 8. Um, the inverted regions are shown between the dashed lines here. You can see that um, all of the values of FST or this G statistic are highly elevated in this region. So that's another piece of evidence that these inverted regions are actually trapping adaptive genes inside of them and allowing them to be involved in, in the evolutionary uh, process of these two ecotypes. Again, using our genome scans, we looked at the overlap of genes found in different regions of the genome with these different uh, signatures of selection. We found not too many genes involved in introgression um, or in reduced introgression, but lots of genes involved in potentially an adaptation uh, shown by the G statistic and the pi ratio. Um, this is probably an indicator overall that what happened with these two ecotypes is that they sort of colonized their uh, habitats that they live in, and then following that, there was some reproductive isolation. It wasn't that colonizing these habitats in the first place was what caused them to be reproductively isolated. So it was probably a story of adaptation followed by the evolution of reproductive isolation. We asked, what are the genes that fall in all of these um, uh, adaptive categories? And we found a lot of really exciting hits. I'll just tell you about a couple categories of them today. Um, so in a lot of these regions that show a signature of selection, we found uh, either developmental or gibberellic acid pathway genes. Uh, gibberellic acid is involved in the regulation of growth and branching in plants. This GA20 oxidase gene is actually a well-known gene in rice. It's a green revolution gene that causes dwarfing in rice. So this gene may be involved in creating short stature plants that we see in those inland races. We also found uh, a lot of candidate genes that are involved in salt tolerance, not surprisingly. So this SOS1 and SOS3 gene, the salt overly sensitive gene we know is involved in salt uh, adaptation in Arabidopsis, we actually find has a pretty strong signature of selection in Mimulus cutatus. Um, so again, all of these genes we'll, we'll be able to look at in, in future research projects. But it's exciting to be able to identify so many of them that are involved in generating the patterns we see in these populations, so the, this diversity of populations that we see in nature. So overall in Mimulus, we asked the question whether we could use this pool sequencing approach to get at our population genome with questions. And the answer was, uh, luckily, it was yes. We were able to get around that statistical noise issue. 
And then secondly, we asked what are the genes and mutations that are involved in generating the inland, annual, and the coastal perennial ecotypes. And we found a pretty long list of candidate genes, many of which had been verified in other studies, and many of which also had found in, in QPL mapping studies, studies that just cross one inland parent and one coastal parent and look at the genetic diversity between them. So we think a lot of these candidate genes have been used over and over again by different populations um, to create these adaptive phenotypes. Um, we also found that with regard to chromosomal inversions, uh, what's likely happening is that these inversions are involved in adaptation. They trap these combinations of beneficial alleles and allow them to be passed down and inherited um, to, the, to the different populations as they go and colonize these habitats. So hopefully what I've showed you today uh, is that we can use genomics to characterize the whole genomes of plants, plants uh, that uh, grow outside you might see in your backyard even. Even though they're not model plants, we can still use these genetic, genomic techniques to learn a lot about the genetics of adaptation. Um, we can use this method of whole genome scanning to actually detect genes that are involved um, in the evolution of adaptive traits. And lastly, once we know what those genes are, we can ask fundamental or we can answer fundamental questions about evolution. We can ask questions like, is evolution repeatable? Do, do organisms use the same genes when they evolve the same traits, either in different populations or across different species? So that's all I have for you today. I have a lot of people to thank, all my collaborators and advisors at Cornell, at University of Toronto, at Michigan State, and also at the Park Grass Experiment in Rothamsted. Um, I had quite a few funding sources as a graduate student and as a postdoc, and I'd like to thank you all again for listening to me today. Because you don't see the local adaptation, mm -hmm. do those only in this country speciate in acidic soil? That's why you don't see the local adaptation. Um, I have a couple theories as to that. What, what do you mean by speciate? The speciation when they actually branched off from whatever their, their precursor was. Yeah, um, I, I never tested whether you could breed the ones from Europe and the ones from the U.S. together. So I don't know if they're reproductively active. I kind of guess. I, I would guess that they're not. I bet they're still pretty compatible. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I might not have seen local adaptation is the pH of the soils in, in the uh, introduced range doesn't span quite, just quite as far as they do at the part grass experiment. If I had maybe sampled one like really extreme population, I think I might have seen a signature of local adaptation. That's one possibility. Um, the other possibility is that um, it was just maybe one really aluminum tolerant variety that colonized the U.S. Um, and maybe that's what grows on all of the different, the different soils. Yeah. Well, that leads me to my second question. Yeah. Then, um, because in our Amazopsis, if you have the genetic drift working, that can mm -hmm. skew your allele frequencies yeah. as well. And I'm wondering if you examine, if you did any comparisons with the different potential founder species from Europe, because I'm wondering if the other adaptation, other ways that you were able to get plants with different flowering times mm -hmm. was due to the fact that they had founders yeah. that had different flowering times with those particular pathways? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. That's something we look for in these kind of genomic studies. 
there's kind of this question as to whether like the if you have multiple colonization events, it's sort of the climb from Europe was just kind of like stamped onto the the east coast of the US and sort of like this is a direct transfer. And I think we would have seen that in our background data. So remember the big tree that I showed you? I think we would have seen uh, early plants clustering with early plants and late plants clustering with late plants uh, in that particular in that particular tree. So I think we would have been able to tell that from our background data. That is one thing we looked at. And we did some more um, sort of analyses of population structure that I didn't that I didn't show you that um, sort of showed that there is there's a little bit of population structure in the US, but it doesn't necessarily correspond with flowering time at all. It's not like the intermediate plants are more related to each other than the early plants or the late plants. But that's a good point. That's definitely something we, we were careful to look for. Yeah. Um, earlier, you were talking about the uh, possibly migrating through multiple genes. Yeah. Is it possible that certain genes simply more parent and less parent over time as environmental factors affect the plants. Like it seems really obvious that the plant came and migrated across the Atlantic several times. Yeah. Yeah. So you mean, um, sorry, asking whether certain genes became selected over time? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely what happened. Um, it's you, you're gonna get sort of a random draw, right? Each time a, a plant gets travels travels across the ocean as a contaminant of something else, like a you know, hay shipment or something. Um, it's sort of a random draw what genes are pulling from the from the uh, native range of the plant. So whatever genes land in the introduced range, that's what, what the plants got to work with as far as evolution. So uh, it's quite possible um, that that type of thing is going on. I think uh, it's a good point that that may be one reason why we didn't find the candidate genes from the native range necessarily involved with adaptation in the, um, in the introduced range. It may be that because it's many different genes from all over the range, um, not just those major ones, that we weren't able to pick up a single uh, a signal for any single one of them because all of them maybe have a little bit of a signal. But no single gene in the introduced range has a really strong signal of adaptation like they do in, in, the, introduced, in the native range. So that's a good point. Yeah. Um, there's a few reasons that cold sequencing uh, that we did it and why it's becoming more popular. So there's this issue with FST, right? So we see the, a large back. So if we just in, sequence individuals and then we looked at the data, we see a lot of background noise. We see a lot of signatures. What looks like a signature of selection there when it isn't really, it's just because those populations aren't really exchanging genes very much. Um, so by creating sequencing pools, we sort of homogenize all the alleles together into one data set and that creates those low FST values, which gives us a way to compare with the background. Um, the other reason that pooled sequencing is really cool is because it's cheap. Instead of doing like a, you know, instead of doing 101 coastal genomes and 92 inland genomes, we just create one big pool and sequence that, and then we create another big pool and we sequence that, and it's much less expensive and we still got to get really uh, exciting data set out of it. So that's the other reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure I know the exact divergence time between like how long ago they had a common ancestor. It probably varies a little bit by population. Um, I want to say less than a million years. So for species, these, these two ecotypes are probably on their way to becoming a different species over you know, millions of years. So um, it's probably less than a million years that they started that process, which is really, really recent when you're talking about the speciation process. Um, I think your other question is kind of related to whether if we took inland plants and we planted them at the coast, would they look like coastal plants? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a really important phenomenon uh, in evolutionary plant biology in particular called uh, phenotypic plasticity. So the environment is going to affect how the plant looks, right? If it grows in the bright sun, maybe it'll be really tall, and if it grows in the shade, it'll be really short. Um, so the differences that we see between the ecotypes is when we grow them indoors in the same environment, and that's a really key point. So we do what's called a common garden experiment. And we make sure that all of the plants are exposed to the exact same conditions, and then we measure their traits, and we still see the differences like I showed you before. So that's something definitely that we had to verify before we did any of the ones at all. Thank you all.